Okay, so this is a video all about the next stage of our science topic. Last session, we created a page which had a pop-up section to it and was all about plants. This one will all be about a certain type of animal. And you will find out about that animal as we explore the PowerPoint. What I want you to do now is to make sure you've got something to take notes with. So you're going to need to press pause and fetch a pen and a piece of paper. Off you go. Right, now let's make a start on this if you're ready to go with um, your paper and pen and you can start making some notes. Right, the animal kingdom is divided into two groups. We have animals with a backbone. So what is a backbone? Well, a backbone is your spine. So can you feel your spine at the moment? Press pause whilst you put your hand behind your back to see if you can find your spine. Now, hopefully you've managed to find that. And all these animals here are examples of animals which have a backbone. Okay. Now, the other group is obviously animals who have no backbone. Now, there are many, many examples of animals which don't have a backbone. And here's some there. We have snails, worms, bees, ladybirds. All examples of animals without a backbone. These are called invertebrates, whilst animals with a backbone are called vertebrates. So we are going to focus on invertebrates rather than try and cover everything. We're going to narrow it down and look at one part of that group and then obviously subgroups from that. So here's some amazing facts about invertebrates. They make up over 95% of the animals on our planet. Some are so tiny you can only see them with a microscope. The largest invertebrate is a giant squid which can grow bigger than a bus. Many invertebrates have soft squishy bodies and they often have a hard shell to protect themselves. Some invertebrates have no head. That was some very interesting research there. Now, there are lots of different types of invertebrates. Some have strange scientific names, but you would have seen many of them before. And here are some of those. We've got mollusks. This is a group which includes slugs and snails, as well as shellfish. They often have soft bodies that they need to keep moist to stay alive. But many, but not all of them, but many have a hard shell to protect themselves. And lids. This is what we call um, segmented or ringed worms. They often have no, they have no legs, sorry, and a soft body made of lots of little sections called segments. Then we have echinoderms. This group of sea creatures are covered in a tough spiny skin. Their bodies are made up of identical parts and starfish are in this group as well as sea urchins. Arthropods. This is a large group of invertebrates. They have a hard outer shell called an exoskeleton, which means outside skeleton. They have jointed legs. There are lots of groups of arthropods that you probably already know. Press pause and see if you can guess some. We have insects. There are over a million different species with new ones being discovered all the time. They often hatch from eggs, which develop into larvae before becoming adults. Adult insects have six legs. Many can't fly. Arachnids. This is a spider family. They have eight legs and two sections to their body, called a head and an abdomen. Many of them spin webs to catch prey. Tarantulas and scorpions are also in this family. Crustaceans. This group have a hard shell, and most of them live in the sea. Crabs, lobsters, and shrimps are in this group. Interestingly, though, woodlice are a type of land-living crustacean. Now, scientists have classified all of these creatures into their groups according to their similarities and differences. So now it's your turn to discover all about these different creatures. See, your task is to go on a bit of a bug hunt. 
how many different types of invertebrates can you find? Could you even look at them and study them as close as you physically can to try and work out which creature you've found and which possible group out of the many different subgroups, some of which I've highlighted to you, that it could belong to? Here's some equipment you may have around the house to help you. Now a paintbrush is quite good to use as it's quite gentle to pick these creatures up with. Remember they're tiny and we are huge in comparison. It's a good way to pick them up without damaging them in your fingers. A spoon is another great example. A plastic spoon is probably a bit tricky to get hold of, but there may be other small implements you have around the house very similar to that. If you're lucky with a net, you might be able to trap flying creatures or um, as I've done with the class uh, before, sometimes you're able to shake a tree or some branches in the tree and some, sometimes creatures fall out and you're able to catch them in a net. Um, obviously at school we have pots with magnifying lids and that's a great opportunity to look at invertebrates. You may not have that at home. So what you may have to use instead is a yoghurt pot. They're good for collecting and allows you to look at the invertebrates safely and allows you to have a look at them closely. If you're lucky to have a magnifying um, glass at home, then that would be brilliant. But many mobile phones have the ability to take a picture and then enhance that and magnify that even more. So you could even take a picture of an invertebrate and then get a really amazing close-up view of that without actually having to touch it or get too close. There are great places to look. Long grass, um, amongst dead leaves, under flower pots and stones, in the soil, on flowers, although it's a bit tricky at this time of year, uh, on the bark of trees, under trees and in shrubs, in wood piles. Make sure you're hunting with someone and make sure you have really thought about where you're hunting to. As obviously if you're doing this, you may hurt yourself or come across something which could, you could hurt yourself upon. So always make sure when you're hunting for bugs, look around the area where you're at. Is it safe? Is there anything around me that might pose a bit of a danger? Whereas if I'm doing it on the pavement near a road, is that the safest place to do it? Whereas if I'm at the park, what other things do I have to consider? Is it clean where I am? Okay. Um, is there any rubbish or anything I might cut myself, sharp stones or anything like that that people who have left behind who have not cleared up after themselves? So those sorts of things you need to consider, as well as some creatures may also and may not appreciate being woken up or moved around. And it is possible for some creatures to give a little bit of a nip or jump or move in a startling manner um, that may cause you to become a little bit distressed. Think about those creatures. If you're having the roof lifted off your house, then they may be a bit startled. They may react in a particular fashion. Be as gentle and thoughtful and considerate as you can. You don't have to pick them up. You could take a picture of it, or you could use one of the links that I've provided um, to get a really good close-up view. So think carefully about what you're doing and how you're doing it, rather than stick your hand straight into a pile of leaves and see what comes out of it. You never know what be in there. There might be hibernating creatures. There may be um, creatures that don't want to be disturbed. So be careful, be thoughtful, and above all, make sure you're with someone who can help you make sure it's safe when you do this, just like we would do in school. Treat that creature with respect and always return it afterwards. They are a living thing. Remember where you found them, okay? If you found it in a particular location, return it to that. That's its natural habitat. That's where it needs to go back to in order to get its source of food or even to perhaps contribute to helping look after its young. So make sure you're always showing those good school values of respect. Now this part of the video will show you how to make an, a different type of interactive element to your book. All you're going to need is two pieces of paper. The first thing you need to do is to fold your paper in half, just like I've done here. You can see I've folded it landscape. So here we have the landscape. Uh, fold right down the middle and that's your first step. 
Right now, once you've achieved that, we are going to make a pullout part for our interactive book. Now, to show you this, I have used a piece of coloured paper. I've only done that because when I did it previously and used plain paper, it made it really difficult to see on the video. So I've used this nice blue paper so as really clear as possible what's trying to be achieved here. But by all means, you can use plain paper and then adjust it and colour it how you want after you have done the work. So what are we going to do with this? Well, first of all, I think if you're going to make a pullout piece, you can either put it horizontally or on a slight diagonal. And that's what I've chosen to do. So what I've done is I've put mine on a slight diagonal here. And then having cut out my piece of paper, I'm going to focus on making a dot here and then a dot this side of it. And then within three centimeters at the max four, I've put another dot there and then another dot this side. So when I pull this away, I have got the dot there, which I'm making a little bit bigger for you, there and there. And once I've got those dots, I'm going to cut a line in between this one and this one, and then this dot and this dot. So it should look something like this. And what I've been able to do is to cut the, a short line in between this point and this point, and this point and this point. There's a variety of different ways of doing that. You could put blue tack underneath the uh, dots, make a hole safely with a pencil that's large enough for a pair of scissors to go in and cut. Or you might be able to score that with something if you had an adult with you in order to do that. Once you've done that, that means you've got two holes that are the same width as your piece of paper. So what should we do next? Well, we will thread our piece of paper through those holes. Now, if I thread my paper this way, it's going to disappear and I'm not really going to see much of it. So actually, what I need to do is I need to turn over my page and thread it from the other side, from this side. And what I'm looking to do is to thread the piece of paper, and this is why I'm using the blue to make it as clear as possible, over the top, and so it comes in underneath like this. Here we go. I've got it, a nice long piece of paper so I can change the length of it if I so wish. And then, when I move it this side back, I've then got a piece of paper that moves this way. And if I move the tab long enough, a piece of information can appear. And if I want, I can put a bit here, another piece of information. And then if I want, as long as I don't make it too long, I could put another one here, represented by my own little smiley face there. So, I can then pull that out and have one piece of information, then another, and then another. Of course, that one thing you have to consider with that is if you make the tab too long, and you're piecing all those pieces of information, you may find it pokes out that side. And if it does poke out that side, it won't fit in with the rest of your book. So just think about how big you want to make those pieces of information, how big you want to make the tab, and how much you want to put on. It might be these would have to be squeezed closer together. Or it might be, since I have such a large amount this side, I could trim a little bit off to make sure it fitted. So those are some of the things you may have to consider when you are making that. It may take more than one attempt, or you might get it right first time. So what I want on this piece of paper is all the information that you have managed to gather. You can represent that all over however you want. But as an interactive element, you then have these pull-out tabs here that will make some of the information a lot more interesting in its presentation. When you could even have a little drawing here showing different aspects of what you're talking about. 